Insurance fraud, cocaine, prostitutes, and hitmen. Sounds like the plot line to a gritty crime novel, but for Catherine Ann Martini, these were just a few of the threads that were sewn together to put her on a direct path to murder. This is Monsters. Catherine Ann Martini was born on April 28, 1958 in New York. She was always known as Kathy as she felt that Catherine was too formal. She grew up in a close-knit family that valued education and stability. As one of three girls, there was plenty of encouragement to be successful and independent and not rely on anyone else to bring happiness. Even as a child, Kathy was highly motivated, intelligent, and ambitious. She was a great student, and outside of the classroom, she was an accomplished swimmer. After high school, Kathy attended Yale, where she studied economics at the same time as pursuing swimming on the varsity swim team. In her spare time, she volunteered at the local YWCA, and she shared her passion for women's issues by establishing a female awareness group at the university. After graduation, Kathy was hired by the First National Bank of Boston as one of less than a handful of women who were accepted into the loan officer training program. She was eventually transferred to Portland, Oregon, where she became one of the first women to handle commercial loans in excess of $500,000. Kathy was viewed as an inspiration and mentor to other women in the male-dominated field of banking, just like she had always desired. Outside of the workplace, her success continued with Kathy being elected as the youngest ever president of the Network of Business and Professional Women of Portland. Kathy finally had the career success that she had worked so hard for. She had a great salary, drove a nice sports car, owned her own condo, and traveled regularly with all expenses paid by her employer. After she moved to Portland in 1983, she signed up for scuba diving lessons in Lake Oswego. She saw it as a chance to meet new people as well as take her love of the water to the next level. Kathy's scuba instructor was a man named Michael David Lissy. It only took one meeting for Kathy to fall for Michael, and she fell hard. Michael owned a chain of scuba stores as well as offering scuba lessons to his customers. Initially, Kathy's friends thought it was an odd pairing because Michael was 34 while Kathy was 25 and he was a free-spirited diver while she was a serious businesswoman. But after they spent some time getting to know the guy, they figured that maybe opposites really do attract. Everyone agreed that he was charming, successful, and charismatic, the perfect match for Kathy. There was just one problem with the pairing. Michael was already married and living with his wife. Two months after they met, the problem was solved when Michael kicked his wife out and moved Kathy in. Six months later, they were married. Outside of their age difference, Michael was exactly the kind of guy Kathy had pictured herself with. He held degrees from Harvard and Oxford, and his dive shop was far from a minor side hobby. He had gigs lined up with the National Geographic Society and a diving contract with both the Department of Defense and Department of State. At least, that's what he told Kathy. On Thursday, July 5th, 1984, Kathy packed her overnight suitcase for a business trip to nearby Eugene. She ate breakfast, kissed her husband goodbye, and drove away from her lakeside condo for the last time. Two hours later, she checked into the Valley River Inn and unpacked her belongings. Once she was settled in, she attended a business meeting, then a luncheon, and then another business meeting. After a short rest in her room, she had dinner and a couple of glasses of wine alone in the hotel restaurant. As she ate, she scribbled some notes down on legal paper while the thoughts were still fresh in her mind. Then, she charged the bill to her company credit card and headed back to her room. That was the last time Kathy would be seen alive. At around 10 a.m. the next morning, the hotel housekeeper came by to make up room 305. It was beyond checkout time, but just in case the guest had slept in, she gently knocked and announced her presence. When there was no answer, she unlocked the door and entered the room. Right away, she could hear that the TV was on and she could make out a single suitcase leaning against the wall of the wardrobe. So, she backed out quietly and decided to make up the room at the end of her rounds. Surely by then, the guest would have checked out. When the housekeeper returned that afternoon, she followed the same procedure to enter the room, knock, 
call out and slowly enter. But as soon as she pushed the door open, she noticed that the TV was still on and the suitcase hadn't moved. As she ventured into the dimly lit room, she made a chilling discovery. Lying face down on the bed was the perfectly still body of a woman. The housekeeper immediately sensed that the woman was dead. In shock, she backed out of the room, closed the door behind her, and ran to the manager's office. Emergency services arrived a few minutes later, and the room was cordoned off as a potential crime scene. The owner of the hotel was able to identify the name of the woman who had booked the room, Kathy Martini Lissy. The preliminary inspection of the hotel room was carried out by two detectives from the Eugene Police Department. Their initial observations was that the room was incredibly neat and organized. Despite Kathy only being booked in for a one-night stay, her whole suitcase was unpacked and her clothes were hanging in the wardrobe. On a desk next to the bed, her work papers were laid out tidily and her toiletries were neatly arranged in the bathroom. The room showed no signs of forced entry either through the front or rear entrances. That first impression is important to mention because it meant that everything that was not tidy looked out of place, which made it immediately suspicious. Right away, the detectives noted that Kathy's pants were bunched up on the ground inside out, like they'd been torn off her body in a rush. On the bed was an upturned ashtray, and next to her trousers was a tampon. The tampon was out of its wrapper, and it appeared to have been used, but not for menstruation. There was no blood on it, just an unidentifiable white substance. When Kathy's body had been photographed, the detectives rolled her over so she was lying on her back. Her hands were clasped together near her neck, and she was wearing only a bra and a dark mesh top. From the front, there were no obvious signs of what had caused Kathy's death, but there were some minor abrasions visible on her head and around her hip. There was also a tuft of hair on the bed beside her body. The detectives noted that she was wearing a gold watch and three rings, but there was no other jewelry on her body. Kathy's purse was found on the nightstand, but there was only a set of car keys inside. They found no wallet, credit cards, or money during the search of the rest of the room. Investigators had to keep an open mind and consider the possibility that Kathy had overdosed or died in some accidental manner, but their gut was telling them otherwise. When the initial scene investigation was over, the officers had to inform Kathy's next of kin about her death. They started with her husband, Michael. When they spoke to Michael on the phone, he sounded pretty shaken up. He agreed to drive from his condo to Eugene to meet with the detectives and bring a few photographs of his wife to confirm that the woman in the hotel was definitely Kathy. At 8.40 p.m., Michael arrived at the station for his first interview, but he wasn't alone. He explained that he was too upset to drive, so he asked two friends that lived in the condo next to his to accompany him. He appeared deeply shaken by the news that his wife might be dead, and he looked as though he might start crying at any moment. With shaky hands, he passed over the pictures of Kathy that were in his pocket. It was clear to the investigators that Kathy was indeed the person they had found in room 305. With that confirmation, Michael immediately began to cry and it took a few minutes for him to regain enough composure for the detectives to begin asking questions. They gently told him that they weren't sure of the circumstances around Kathy's death and they needed to establish if there was any cause to believe it was murder. The detectives started to try to get to know Kathy a little better. They asked about her and Michael's relationship, and Michael explained that the pair had only known each other for a year, and yet they were married and planning on having children soon. After learning a bit more about her background, they asked if she drank alcohol, and Michael told them that she only drank socially. Then they asked if Kathy took drugs. Michael's answer couldn't have been any more surprising. He immediately stated that Kathy was a frequent cocaine and MDMA user and that she always bought drugs when she visited Eugene. He also commented that she carried a significant amount of cash to fund her drug purchases and that she often met up with shady characters to do the deals. When he was asked if Kathy had any contacts or acquaintances in Eugene that might have visited her on the night of the murder, Michael dropped a second bombshell. He told the detectives that he and Kathy had an open relationship and that she liked to sleep with other men during her work trips. Michael's description of Kathy as a drug-using swinger didn't match up with what the detectives had seen in the tidy and organized hotel room, but they knew that looks could be deceiving. Now that the investigators had some information about who Kathy was, they got to the critical question about where Michael had been at the time of her death. He explained that he had been traveling between his two stores during the day. 
At around 6.30 p.m., he went to a tavern with an employee for a couple of drinks. On his way home, he stopped over at a friend's house until around 9.30 when he drove back to the condo and passed out. He woke up the next morning at 9.30 a.m. and found out Kathy was dead that afternoon when detectives called and asked him to come to Eugene. He also added that he had last spoken to Kathy the day she left when she called to tell him that she had left her toothpaste at home. Finally, Michael was asked if Kathy had a life insurance policy and he replied that he thought she might, but it was through her work so he wasn't sure of the details. When the investigators ended the interview, they were no closer to understanding whether Kathy's death was murder or something else. They hoped that the autopsy results would give them the answer to that question. The day after Kathy's body was found, her autopsy was held and the detective's gut instinct about the case proved to be accurate. The ME ruled that Kathy's cause of death was strangulation and also noted a two-inch area of scalp where her hair was missing, which matched the clump of hair found on the bed beside her body. There were two small grazes on the right side of her face and a large Y-shaped abrasion behind her left earlobe. There were two further marks on her right hip. Kathy's body also showed signs of sexual intercourse before her murder, but it was impossible to determine if she was raped, sodomized, or had consensual sex. The medical examiner also found no evidence that Kathy had been menstruating at the time of her murder. Interestingly, a more detailed search of the crime scene also turned up a half-used tube of toothpaste amongst Kathy's belongings, something that contradicted Michael's story. So, Kathy was definitely the victim of a homicide, and now all they had to do was find out who was responsible. The first priority was to learn about Michael and then attempt to verify his alibi. Michael David Reed was born on March 18, 1949 in San Diego, California. He changed his last name to Lissy when he was an adult after his parents separated and his mother remarried. He had quite the record with law enforcement, but not the way you might imagine. In 1976, Michael reported that he had been the victim of a holdup at a Portland KFC restaurant where he was the assistant manager. In 1977, he said he had been mugged twice and his apartment had been burglarized. He made a $10,000 insurance claim on the home burglary. As far as a criminal record goes, in 1978 he was arrested for driving while his license was suspended, and in 1979 he was arrested for failing to appear in court on that charge. He must have had the worst luck ever because he reported another home burglary in 1981 along with another big insurance claim. When investigators took a closer look at the old police reports about the mugging and the robberies, they found an interesting pattern. All of them had resulted in a financial payout to Michael. In an effort to get more details about the old incidents, investigators spoke to the owner of the KFC store where Michael had been held up. The owner told him that Michael had actually been fired for stealing money from the business and then immediately afterward he filed a workers' compensation claim based on the robbery. The owner told him that Michael had actually been fired for stealing money from the business and then immediately afterward he filed a workers' compensation claim based on the robbery. The claim was approved by KFC's insurance and Michael was paid out even though at least one of his co-workers told management that the holdup had never happened. The managers chose to believe Michael's version of events despite his dubious history in the business. The KFC store where Michael was the assistant manager had previously been the best performing franchise in Portland. That was until Michael started working there. Very quickly, their profits bottomed out and large amounts of cash from the safe went missing. It was only after Michael moved to another store and the same thing happened that management took a closer look and realized what was going on. Michael's associates said he had set up a short-ringing scheme where he rigged the tills to appear as if they had taken in less money than they actually had. It turned out that Michael wanted the money to put towards a much larger enterprise. Drugs. He intended to use the money he stole from KFC to set up a drug trafficking ring where he would smuggle narcotics from Jamaica into Florida on a sailboat. But when it came time to put the money down for the boat, Michael bought a car instead. It was right around that time that KFC realized what was going on and they fired him. If you could get a degree in insurance fraud, Michael Lissy would have a PhD. But that would be the only degree he had, since he certainly didn't have one from Harvard or Oxford. In fact, he had barely graduated from high school. Oh, and there was no contract with National Geographic or any government agencies either. On top of his proficiency with fraud and theft, 
Michael also seemed to have a way with women. In the late 1960s, Michael had been married to a woman named Martha. Sometime in the early 1970s, the couple divorced and Michael moved to Portland. After working at a few food service outlets, he scored the KFC job based on some phony references. In April of 1978, he remarried a woman named Helen Smith. Michael told his friends that he had taken out a double indemnity life insurance policy on his wife and that they planned to stage an accident so she can make an injury claim. But that was only a half-truth. The policy existed, but his real plan was to have Helen killed. The plan was always to get the entire payout, not just a partial payout from an injury. Michael spoke with two of his associates about pushing Helen down the stairs and staging the scene to look like a robbery gone bad. But before he got a chance to put the plan into action, Helen left Michael and filed for divorce. They were just three months into their marriage when Helen discovered that Michael was having multiple affairs with other women, many of whom were underage. It turned out that on top of drugs and cash, he had a taste for sex workers who he visited most nights of the week. All of that was going on while Helen was pregnant with Michael's child. Thankfully, when Helen filed for divorce, she canceled her life insurance policy at the same time. She also filed for paternity, which Michael denied. Helen agreed to waive all of her child support entitlements in exchange for Michael relinquishing any right to visitation. On July 5th, 1979, the divorce from Helen was finalized and Michael wasted no time in setting the stage for a new wife. Michael met Elise Dunn when she started working for him at one of his scuba stores. She became his third wife just a couple of months after they first met, and within six months he was making plans to get rid of his mother-in-law so that Elise could claim an inheritance. It was only when investigators spoke to his living exes that they discovered how he had managed to get them to marry him in the first place. Helen had believed that Michael owned a Caribbean island and several businesses that he ran with his grandfather there. She was also led to believe that Michael owned a string of rental properties across Portland, and that's where all of his cash came from. There's no doubt that he used these fake family ties to woo Elise and later Catherine as well. But it wasn't only potential insurance fraud targets he was lying to. Michael also claimed Helen and his child as dependents on his federal tax returns despite denying the child was his, divorcing Helen and never having paid a dollar to either of them. On July 24th, investigators spoke to Elise about the man she had once been married to, and she had a very interesting story to tell. Elise first met Michael when she was employed to do the books for his scuba store. Unsurprisingly, he regularly asked her to cook the books, and he used the same scheme that had worked at KFC. Under record sales and decrease monthly earnings so that he could pocket the unreported cash and pay less in taxes. Elise saw him take between $500 to $1,000 in cash at least a few times a week directly out of the tills at the store. When Michael first started showing interest in her romantically, he took her to visit three yachts, which he said his ex-wife had taken from him in the divorce, as well as an airplane and properties. He also told Elise that he was paying $2,000 a month in child support. They got married after knowing each other for three months, and predictably, their relationship was far from traditional. Elise seems to have been the only wife complicit in Michael's tax and insurance schemes. She was also the only wife who knew exactly what Michael spent his money on. Michael's taste for sex workers hadn't changed, and he hired them frequently during their short marriage. So frequently that she told investigators he was being serviced up to three times a day, sometimes even when she was at home with him. She was also forthcoming about the fact that until the last few weeks, they still had a good relationship with each other. That was despite having been replaced by Kathy and kicked out of her home. She said that even after the divorce, she used to meet up for lunch frequently and she still had done the books for the scuba store. But that all had changed when she found out about Kathy's murder. Before she told the detectives that part of the story, Elise had a question. What was the room number that Kathy had been murdered in? They told her it was room 305. Elise slowly removed a flyer from her handbag, which advertised a sale at the scuba store. On the back was a handwritten number. It was 305. Elise explained that she found out Kathy had been murdered from Michael when she called him about a lunch date they had. On the same day as that phone call, Michael asked her to come and meet him at the condo they had once shared. He took her into the bedroom and handed her an envelope that he told her to destroy. 
He told Elise the envelope contained a phone number for Kathy's drug dealer, and he didn't want to embarrass Kathy's family by letting on that their perfect daughter was a drug user. It was only later that Elise removed the flyer from the envelope and read the number on the back. At first, she was confused about its meaning, and she shoved the paper into the back pocket of her jeans and forgot about it. But when the detectives contacted her for a statement, she remembered the flyer and decided to bring it along. Elise also told the officers that the scuba store was heavily in debt to suppliers. She told them that every time Michael got into trouble with money, he would come up with a new insurance scheme. She had gone along with two of the fake robberies and had corroborated his stories in order to secure a payout. During their marriage, she also had signed up for a large loan, which Michael promised to pay back. But after the divorce, he refused to make the payments, and Elise quit her job at the scuba store. It didn't take her long to get a job at a large accountant's firm, but by then the repayments on the loan were taking up more than half of her monthly salary. She took on a second job to make ends meet, and when that still wasn't enough, she agreed to perform sexual acts on Michael in exchange for money. That went on throughout the entire time he was married to Kathy, and it didn't stop after she died. Michael also had told Elise that he was only marrying Kathy for her banking connections. He believed her position in the bank would enable him to secure much bigger loans for his various schemes, and if that didn't work, he would use her wealthy parents as co-signers. He reassured his ex that once he had what he wanted from Kathy, they would get divorced and he would remarry Elise. Sure enough, right after Michael and Kathy got married, they applied for the loans, but they were declined because the scuba stores weren't turning a profit. After that, Michael told Elise that he was planning to get rid of Kathy by lacing her cocaine and making sure she took it during a business trip so that he got the life insurance multiplier offered by her employer. It turned out that Michael had taken a life insurance policy out on Kathy, which named him as the sole beneficiary. No surprise there. But Kathy also had a policy through her employer, which was worth nearly four times as much if she died during work time. Because she had been murdered while on a business trip, the policy was worth $200,000. Michael was the sole beneficiary of that policy as well. Elise continued to explain that just a few days before the murder, she started to receive threatening phone calls that warned her not to say anything about Michael to anyone. Otherwise, the truth about her involvement in the fake insurance payouts would be revealed to her employer. Elise initially wasn't going to say anything, but when she found out what happened to Kathy, she became fearful of her own life. She was certain that her ex-husband was involved in Kathy's murder, and so when the investigators had asked to speak to her about Michael, she decided to be completely honest with them, even if it meant getting in trouble herself. The picture being painted about Michael was far from flattering. Insurance fraudster, philanderer, and sex addict. Investigators suspected that murderer needed to be added to that list too, but just when they thought they had a handle on the type of person Michael was, his alibi checked out. Well, sort of. The employee that Michael said he had gone to the tavern with and the friend he had visited on his way home both backed up his timeline for the night of Kathy's murder. The only time unaccounted for was after he supposedly passed out around 9.45 p.m. The drive to Eugene would have taken about two hours, which would have been enough time to get to the hotel, murder Kathy, and get back home before he was seen in the morning. Also, Michael's involvement would line up with the fact that there was no sign of forced entry at the hotel. Now all they needed to do was place him at the scene of the crime. At first, no one could say for sure if they had seen Michael at the Valley River Inn on the night of Kathy's murder. That was until a night maintenance supervisor confirmed seeing someone who looked like Michael walking from the staircase toward the main doors and exiting through the lobby. She remembered the man in the photo because he was so big, and she recalled that he was wearing faded blue jeans and a short-sleeved, dark-colored top. On the same day that Elise was interviewed, detectives drove to Michael's apartment and his business premises armed with search warrants. By then, they were certain that Michael was responsible for Kathy's murder. Michael was home at the time, and he sat on the sofa as officers began moving through the rooms. The detectives read him his Miranda rights and informed him that they had spoken to a number of witnesses who implicated him for Kathy's murder. They showed him the flyer with 305 written on the back, and they shared that a witness could place him at the hotel on the night of the murder. That's when Michael invoked his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination and called his lawyer to come to his house. During the search, officers found an envelope with a handwritten note inside. 
The letter purported to be Kathy's will and it left everything to her husband. Her parents' names had been removed throughout the document and replaced with Michael's, including on documentation related to her life insurance policy. In his vehicle, they found a fully loaded 357 Colt Python revolver with a serial number that matched a gun that had been stolen earlier that year. So, the gun was alarming, the paperwork was suspicious, and Michael's demeanor was inconsistent with his statements. But none of that was conclusive evidence that Michael was responsible for the murder. Since news of Kathy's murder had first been released to the public, it was making headline news nearly every day. Sometimes, that can lead to an excess of dead-end tips, but the news coverage paid off when Molly Griggs came forward. When Molly read an article about the murder of Catherine Lissy, she immediately put two and two together and she called the police department to report what she knew. Molly had the misfortune of crossing paths with Michael while she was a sex worker during a challenging period of her life. They met up on multiple occasions and sometimes more than once in a single day. During one of those interactions, Michael had offered her money for something unexpected. He told Molly that he needed to hire someone to carry out a few hits. First, he needed a young guy to get beaten up so bad that he died. Then, he needed an older couple from the coast to die in an accident, and he also wanted a warehouse to burn down. Oh, and there was a woman he wanted raped and strangled. Michael assumed that Molly was the kind of girl who knew people who could carry out jobs like that, and he offered to pay her to be the middleman. But it turned out he was wrong. The request frightened Molly, and she refused to meet up with Michael ever again. After talking to detectives about what she knew, Molly agreed to help them in the investigation. She wore a wire and made a call to Michael in an attempt to get him to confess to either asking her to hire a hitman or the murder itself. But Michael refused to talk over the phone. He only agreed to meet up with Molly at a local cafe when she told him he had to pay her not to talk to the police. When they met, Michael told Molly that he believed his phones were being tapped, which was an accurate assumption. He refused to say anything about the murder or that he had asked her to hire a hitman, but he did give Molly $300 so she could get out of town. As it turned out, Molly had turned down Michael's request to find a hitman, but many of the other sex workers and drug dealers he associated with weren't so morally offended. One of the women he had talked to had connected Michael with a guy who was willing to carry out the hits, but he never went through with it because he got arrested. Another facilitated the sale of a weapon to Michael, which later matched the gun found in his vehicle. Yet another man said he was going to carry out the hit, but when he met Michael in person to collect the cash and the gun, he realized how dangerous he was. I guess him asking for someone to do a hit didn't immediately give that impression. It was during these many interviews with Michael's web of street contacts that detectives first heard the name Dave Wilson. Gretchen Schumacher wasn't the first woman to mention Dave's name to officers, but she was certainly the most suspicious. Like Molly, she was a sex worker who had met Michael when he solicited her. Gretchen didn't service men, so she acted as a pimp to connect him with the youngest women, in exchange for a fee, of course. During her first conversation with investigators, she said she had set Michael up with a 15-year-old, and she admitted that she was also, quote, into child molesting. But despite all that, she denied any involvement in Kathy's murder or knowing who Dave Wilson was. It was only when officers talked to Tina LaPlante that they found out the real story. Like the others, Tina was regularly visited by Michael for sexual services. During one of their liaisons, he asked Tina if she knew anyone who could carry out a rape and murder for him. If she found someone, she would get paid $500 to put them in touch. She agreed and contacted Dave Wilson, who told her that he was willing to do the job for $5,000. Tina acted as the broker and put the two men in touch. She also recruited Gretchen as a getaway driver and offered her own vehicle for transport to and from Eugene. When Tina was approached by the police about her role in the murder, she agreed to help with the investigation, but only if she was guaranteed immunity. The choice to help wasn't done from a place of guilt or remorse for her role in Kathy's death. No, she'd been warned that conspiracy to commit murder would put her away for years, so helping the police was a more attractive option. When the paperwork was signed, a recording device was set up on Tina's phone, and she placed a call to Michael Lissy. During the first phone call on October 8th, she began discussing the grand jury inquiry into the murder, but Michael was still nervous about his phone being tapped, so he called her back from a payphone a few minutes later. 
When he asked Tina if she had talked to the police, she said she had pleaded the fifth to avoid getting involved. That seemed to satisfy Michael's paranoia, and the conversation continued. Tina suggested that Michael give Dave Wilson $25,000 to take all of the blame for the murder if the police ever came knocking. They decided on a plausible story that he could tell investigators about him knowing Kathy because he was her drug dealer and that he killed her in a moment of passion while he was high on drugs. That would likely mean the murder charges would be reduced to manslaughter and he might only serve three to five years in prison. Once he was out, Michael would simply pay him twenty-five grand from the money he expected to receive from Kathy's life insurance policy. Once the details were sorted out, Michael asked Tina to act as the middleman once again and set up the arrangement with Dave. On October 11th, Tina wore a wire while she met with Dave in person to discuss the offer. It wasn't hard to convince him. In his world, $25,000 was like winning the lottery. Before Tina and Dave went their separate ways, he told her explicit details about the murder itself. Obviously, he didn't know that Tina was wearing a wire or that the police were observing their conversation from just feet away. Dave told Tina that he had been given money to buy a suit, get a haircut, and hire a nice-looking rental car to make sure he would fit in at the hotel. He said that the cash wasn't enough for the rental car bond, which is why they ended up using Tina's vehicle. He had been told to stage the room to look like a robbery and make sure that the woman was raped as well. Dave explained that Kathy had led him into the room when he said he was a friend of her husband. Once he was inside, he attacked Kathy and tried to gag her, but the gag didn't work, so he removed it. Then he said Kathy wanted to talk and they laid in the bed together talking. By then, she had figured out that Michael had sent Dave to rough her up, but she couldn't understand why. Dave refused to give her any answers, and when he was sick of her talking, he hit her. Then he told her to get on her stomach, and he pulled the gag down around her throat. He used his hands to twist the gag until she stopped breathing, while he yelled, Die, bitch! When her face went purple and her eyes bulged out of her head, he released the gag. Dave also told Tina that Gretchen waited outside in the getaway car the whole time and never entered the hotel room. Once Kathy was dead, he took everything of value from the room, including her gold necklace. But he had taken more of her personal belongings than he should have, which made Gretchen angry. She was worried it would make it easier to connect Dave to the crime if the police ever searched his place. Dave defended himself by saying it was his insurance in case Michael screwed them over. The insurance con man getting conned. Ironic. When Tina asked Dave where all the items were now, he said he got rid of them that night by selling and exchanging them with his street contacts. He had thrown her credit cards out of the car on the drive home in hopes that people would pick them up and use them. In his mind, that would make Kathy's murder look more like a drug deal gone bad than a hit. Tina noticed that Dave took great pleasure in retelling the story of Kathy's murder. He had even become visibly aroused when he got to the part about strangling her until she stopped twitching. By that point in the conversation, Tina had become extremely fearful for her own safety. She had recorded Dave's confession, but if he decided to attack her then and there, it was unlikely that the police would be able to strike quickly enough to stop him. And yet, in spite of her fear, she kept asking him questions. Because there was only one thing he hadn't explained in enough detail. Michael's role in setting up the murder. When Tina asked Dave what would happen if Michael didn't come through with the money, Dave replied, quote, I can prove it. I got evidence that I can have planted on him, near him. You better believe the fucking jury will eat that up. They'll look at him and think, well, that low life. And then he talked about the sexual aspect of Kathy's murder. He said, quote, I shouldn't have listened to the part about Michael wanting it to look like a rape, because when it came down to it, I couldn't rape her. In fact, she had to help me get off. I never did fuck her. Dave also confessed to Kathy not being his first murder. He said, quote, There's one thing you gotta see. I can adjust to any situation. You know I can ignore it like it isn't there, if the money's right. Nothing in his story ever explained the tampon that was found in the room with Kathy's body. The day after her chilling meeting with Dave, Tina called Michael to tell him the deal was done and that Dave would take the fall for Kathy's murder. Michael took the opportunity to proposition Tina for sex and he invited her over. When she said she couldn't visit because she had her child with her, he told her she could bring them along. The detectives who had been listening in on all the phone calls and conversations now had enough evidence to prove Michael was equally as culpable for Kathy's murder as the man who had strangled her. 
There was just one loose end that needed to be tied up. How had the night maintenance person identified Michael as the person they saw at the hotel on the night of the murder? Well, when you look at a picture of Michael and a picture of Dave alongside each other, the resemblance is uncanny. To test their theory, they showed the employee a series of headshots and asked her to pick out the person she had seen on the night Kathy died. Sure enough, she picked out Dave Wilson and not Michael Lissy from the photo lineup. On October 13, 1984, Dave Wilson and Michael Lissy were arrested. They were held without bail on accusations of aggravated murder, robbery, rape, and sexual abuse, all in the first degree. Despite Dave agreeing to the deal with Michael to take full responsibility for the murder, he pleaded not guilty to all of the charges, and so did Michael. A subsequent search of Dave Wilson's home turned up no items connected to Kathy or Michael. The gold necklace she always wore has never been found. As for Gretchen's role in the crime, well, when she got wind that the police were on to her, she left town. She returned a month later and was picked up and charged with conspiracy to commit murder and robbery. She pleaded guilty and received a 20-year sentence. The other targets of Michael's hits were believed to be Elise's new partner who would have hindered his efforts to reconcile with his ex-wife. Elise's parents were likely to be the older couple he wanted taken out so that she would benefit from a significant inheritance, and the warehouse he wanted burned down belonged to the scuba store. Before Michael's trial began, his lawyer filed a motion to have all of the wiretap recordings thrown out as well as every piece of evidence collected during the various searches at Michael's properties. Those motions were denied. On January 21, 1985, the trial got underway. The prosecution's case was pretty clear-cut. Michael wanted to benefit from Kathy's insurance policy and he wanted to get back together with his ex-wife, Elise. He knew he would be the most likely suspect if he did the killing himself, so he used his network of pimps, sex workers, and drug dealers to act on his behalf. They were going to prove that Michael was a known fraudster, liar, drug user, cheater, schemer, and murderer. On the other hand, the defense's opening statement was in direct opposition to the characterization of Michael as a killer. Michael's lawyer said, quote, The evidence is going to show Mr. Lissy is not a monster. He is a man caught up in circumstances. Perhaps he's guilty of many things, but he's not guilty of murder. They asserted that Michael only talked about his wife's insurance policy and a plan to have her killed because he was trying to impress sex workers. They said, quote, Mr. Lissy was playing a sort of game with them, getting wrapped up in something sinister and exciting and sort of morbid. They also claimed that the only reason Michael lied to investigators was because he was scared and confused. I imagine that might have been some of the last feelings Kathy had before the life was strangled out of her. After a two-week trial and just five hours of deliberation, the jury found Michael David Lissy guilty of aggravated murder. He was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum period of 30 years. The day after Michael's conviction, Dave Wilson changed his plea to guilty. He was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 20 years. Michael unsuccessfully appealed his conviction and sentence in 1987. He continued to scheme while he was in prison, including attempting to become an informant to snitch on other inmates. Unsurprisingly, his history meant he was too unreliable to be trusted by authorities as a credible source of information. In April of 2014, after nearly three decades behind bars, Michael David Lissy was granted parole. That means that this monster now walks free in Portland. So if you're a single lady and meet a charming scuba diving instructor, do a background check. If you're a fan of true crime, hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss an episode. You can also hit like or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.